Hi, my name is Miranda Vaughn and I am the Reference and Archives Librarian here at the Mississippi Library Commission and you are watching part two of our four-part series on researching Black ancestry. So let's get started. Okay, so if you watched our first video, part one, it was just an introduction and an overview of how to get started with researching Black ancestry, um, some information about how to get started with genealogy, some tips, and um, just a general uh, introduction to what we're going to be doing here. In part two, we're going to start looking at actual resources that you might want to use for your genealogy research. And we're specifically going to look at national records. Um, this says national records really is just records that aren't directly related to Mississippi or housed in the state of Mississippi. So some of these are databases, some of them are websites, some of them are government institutions. Um, there's just a variety here and this is not all <laughs> um, of the resources at all, but this is just um, a a nice list um, to get you started. It's got to give you an idea of where to look for some of these resources. So first of all, the census is going to be your best friend for any of your genealogy research. Um, just a little background information. The census first began in the year 1790. When it first started, it was basically just a few questions. You're basically just listing who's in your household, starting with the head of household, of course, white male, who is the head of household. Then they wanted you to list your um, anyone in the household who was a free white male, 16 years or older, and that was for military purposes. Um, most of these questions in the census are going to be asked for taxation purposes, military purposes, things like that. Um, then any anyone under any males under the age of 16 in the house, then any free white women, then any other free persons, and then the enslaved were listed last. And it was just kind of like, how many enslaved do you have? And that was the end of it. Over time, though, there have been a lot of questions added, obviously. Um, if you looked at our modern day census, there's a lot more questions. Um, the census is kept confidential for 72 years. So it's taken every 10 years and then it will not be released to the public for 72 years. So the last census that was released to the public was released in 2012 and it was the 1940 census. So if you're doing research this year in the year 2021, um, you're only going to have access to the years 1790 through, through 1940 to look at. And then next year, 2022, the 1950 census, census will be released and so on. So just a heads up about that. If you're looking for anything past 1940, you're not going to get it until next year. Um, most of the information that's uh, that is presented on the census is about families. Um, you have like the list, the head of household, and then everyone in the house underneath him. This obviously is going to help you out tremendously with figuring out um, who goes where on your family tree. So that section is really important. There's also economic and vocational information that is listed on there as well. Um, race, age, gender demographics, and things like that. And I did want to point out because the census records are so vital to genealogy research that most of the sources that I'm going to mention today are going to have access to census records. So you can find them pretty easily. And this is just an example that I wanted to show you of um, how the questions kind of changed over time and evolved and got a little bit more detailed. Um, this is an example of questions that were on the 1850 census. So instead of just listing the number of enslaved people and then moving on, they added more um, questions that would give you more details about the enslaved. So this, of course, can be helpful when researching Black ancestry so that you can um, differentiate between them a little bit better. 
um, of course, they ask the sex, the age. Um, if they were black, you would put a B for black. If they were mixed race, you would put an M for mulatto. So if you see that on any of the records from this time and maybe surrounding censuses as well, um, know that that's what that stands for. This is an example of a, a census record from the year 1900. This is actually from um, some research that one of our reference librarians here ha uh, was conducting for the Oliver Dickerson family. So I'm going to zoom in here and use Mr. Dickerson's family for an example to kind of show you what you'll be looking at when you're looking at these census records. So this is Mr. Dickerson, as you can see, he is listed as the head of household. Then underneath him, you have his wife and then a son, a daughter, a son, and so forth. You have all their children there. Um, as you can see, just an overview, <laughs> this is all done in cursive um, and hand handwritten. And up until modern times, that's how it was. So this particular record looks pretty legible. Sometimes you're going to come across records that are not quite so legible, and so that can sometimes cause issues in your research. You might find the document that you're needing, but it might not be something that's legible. So just be aware of that when you're doing your research. Um, this column here is for race. So he's a black man, so there's a B here for black. When you're looking at some of these, uh, the race columns on these, um, there's usually going to be either a B for black or an N or an NEG for Negro. Those two were used interchangeably for a long time to represent the black race. So if you see an N, know that that's what that's for. Um, but you'll either see an N or a B usually there. The next column is gender. So he's a male. There's an M there. As you can see, his wife is an F for female and so on. Then the section is for his birthday, um, the age, the next one is an M for married, and of course his children have S's for single, how many years they've been married, 14 years on here. Um, this next section is for his wife to answer uh, about how many kids that they've had and how many children are still surviving or who didn't survive. Um, then here you have birth information. So he was born in Mississippi. The next column, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, he was born in Mississippi. The next column um, is where his father was born, which is Maryland. His mother was born in Georgia, we see. Um, and then the last column is more about like occupation and home ownership, or the last few columns. So it says that he's a planter, farmer. He spent zero years unemployed. Um, these three questions right here, you can see he answered yes to. Those are about whether he can read and write and speak English. Um, this is, there's an O here for um, he owns his own home instead of renting. He um, owns it freely. There's not a mortgage. He owns a farm instead of an actual home. So there's an F for farm. And then this last number here is just the number that his farm was given. And as you can see, it's just kind of in chronological order. He's given whatever the next number is. It's 128, the next one's 129, and so on. So that's just to give you an idea of what kind of information you would be looking at on the census records, what exactly they look like as far as the, the handwriting and how legible they are. And um, yeah, just to give you an idea of what you'll be looking at when you're actually looking at census records. The National Archives and Records Administration is a good national resource. They have, of course, census records, military records, court documents. Um, their court documents are going to be federal courts, not state courts. Um, so if you're looking for something that's from a state court, then you're probably going to find it more likely at a state archive or a state library. Um, everything that they're going to have is federal. So federal agencies, all of that. They have immigration and naturalization records. Um, I'll go to their website so you can kind of see what that looks like. 
Um, they have resources here for genealogists that you can look through. You can look through their microfilm catalog. Um, the National Archives doesn't have a lot of digitized collections, so a lot of the records that would be of interest to you, um, researching Black ancestry is going to be something that you're going to have to see like on microfilm or something that you're going to have to either see in person or for a fee, you can write to them and they will do the research for you and send you what you need. So it just depends on what's more convenient for you. Um, some of the records that they have are found at other places, so I encourage you to not jump into paying for things <laughs> um, before you search elsewhere for some of the records that they have. Um, as I mentioned, they also have federal agency records, and these can come in handy, um, especially when it comes to WPA records. So the WPA is the Work, Works Progress Administration, or as it's listed on here, Work Projects Administration. Um, they did a lot of things. They were a New Deal program, one of the many <laughs> New Deal programs. And, but one of the things that they did that is really helpful to genealogists is they sent um, field agents around to collect histories for all of the counties. So a lot of the county histories that we have um, available either on microfilm, some of them are digitized, some of them are in print, um, those were mostly compiled by the WPA. So if you can get a hold of any of their records, they can be very helpful giving you county histories and that sort of thing. Um, there are also several New Deal agencies that have photographs of families and other information. I know the Farm Security Administration went around to homes and um, interviewed people in those homes and got information about like all the people who lived in the homes. Um, Um, they went around to homes, got information um, from all of the people who lived in the homes to try to figure out who needed to be rehoused in these federal housing uh, units that were to help farmers who had lost their farms or were in the process of losing their farms during the Great Depression. So a lot of those records have photographs because the field agents would actually take photographs of the families in front of their homes um, in order to keep on file. Um, it for each family had their own file, so they would add photographs to that as part of the documentation. Yeah, so just look at, um, you can look at some of the agencies and their records on the National Archives websites and their finding aids and that sort of thing if you think that there's something that those agencies might have. Um, photographs are particularly um, valuable in genealogy research, so any of any agencies are aware organizations that might have photographs um, are always interesting to look at. Next we have the Library of Congress. The Library, the Library of Congress and the National Archives has a lot of over, overlapping material. The National Archives, most of their collections start in 1790. They're not really supposed to house things before then um, because that was kind of the beginning of the nation as we know it. The Library of Congress has stuff from before 1790 and after 1790, so they have a good bit of um, resources for you. Let me go to their website because they have some good genealogy resources specifically for African American genealogy. This is called Journey into Your Past. Um, you can go to their website and just look this up and it has a list of all kinds of resources that they have that you can look at. Um, this, this section is particularly interesting, the slave narratives and slavery. Um, they have Voices from the Days of Slavery, which is a collection of oral histories from formerly enslaved peoples that can be really cool to listen to, can also have really interesting information that might be helpful to you in your search. So I've men I mentioned in the first video that oral histories can be great resources. So any of these repositories that have um, oral histories there, I encourage you to just look into them and see. It can be time consuming to listen to the oral histories, um, but most of these are gonna be transcribed during the process of being transcribed. So that helps a little bit too. Um, but they have a whole lot of different 
um, resources that are specifically for African American genealogy. So I encourage you to just look at those as well because I don't really have time to go all over all of them in this video, but this is a great resource for you. As I mentioned, they have um, slave narratives and oral histories. And then the other thing that I really wanted to show you um, that is a service of the Library of Congress is their Chronicling America um, project. This is, this is an ongoing project um, where they're recording all of the newspapers in the United States over time. So um, these are searchable. You can search the newspaper directory from 1690 to the present. If you know the title of the newspaper, you can look it up alphabetically or you can search by these different keywords um, and location. Um, newspapers can be very helpful because they contain obituaries, marriage announcements, community news, all kinds of information, and they're all dated, <laughs> so, you know, very well recorded. Um, all of those things can be really helpful. The one thing that I really wanted to point out um, that they do, let me, let me do a search really quick. We'll go to Mississippi and we will look up, let's just do Adams County and we'll do a search for that. We'll just click on the first one, the Daily Free Trader out of Natchez, Mississippi. Okay, so when you click on it, they have all the cataloging information about it as well. But one thing that I find really helpful is you go down here to the bottom and it has holdings and it has complete holdings information. And it will give you, you click on that, it gives you this list of all of the places who have this newspaper, copies of this newspaper. And it'll tell you like if they're on microfilm, here it says that the Mississippi Department of Archives and History has it, it gives you a little bit of information about it, it tells you when it was last updated. So you get an idea of what, if, um, how, what kind of copies that they have of this paper. So it gives you an idea of um, the date range that they have of this paper. As you can see, they have copies in at the San Diego State Library or State University Library. Anyway, if you can't find the newspaper digitized somewhere, um, you can go here and it'll give you a list of places to contact or visit um, that actually hold that newspaper. Very, very helpful. I definitely use this a lot. Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com <laughs> is probably the most well-known site that's used in genealogy. They are a subscription service, so you can either pay for a subscription, which I think it starts off at like $25 a month or something like that, and they have different packages that you can subscribe to. Um, or you can check with your local library. Some libraries have their own subscriptions and you can, if you're a patron of that library, you can access Ancestry.com inside the library. Um, so this is Ancestry Library and this is what um, it will look like if you are using Ancestry.com uh, from your local library or from a library. And you just click on begin searching and you can get as detailed as you want with the people that you're looking for. Um, I'll just go ahead and give you an example with our Mr. Dickerson that we were looking at earlier. He is from Cahoma County. So I'm just going to click on Cahoma County, Mississippi. I think his birth year was 1860. If you know for sure, then you can click this exact to this year. Um, it gives you those options, or if you're not really sure, you can unclick that. And let's do a search. Um, yeah, so you have several things that come up. Census records, of course, um, deaths, records and things, 
obviously some of these people are not going to be the Oliver Dickerson that we are looking for, so you can go through there and search and see what they have. This is his wife's name, so this is going to be, and he's a planter farmer, father's from Maryland, mother's from Georgia, so that's going to be our guy. Um, so that's just an example of Oh, and this is actually the census that we were looking at earlier from 1900. Small world. Um, you can also look at, they have charts and forms um, that can help you when you're organizing all of your information. Um, this, as you can see, looks kind of like a, branches out kind of like a family tree. So you can look at those if those would be helpful for you. Um, there's a learning center here. They just have a lot of different things that you can look through. Um, and this will help the, uh, they have African-American research information as well. This is actually a really good resource um, because it tells you kind of how to interpret documents when you're researching black ancestry. Of course, as I mentioned before, and I mentioned here, start with the present and then work your way backwards. Um, they have slave schedules and mortality schedules, which is something that I wanted to mention as well. This is an example of what a slave schedule looks like. Um, and it's basically just a list of the sla of enslaved people, age, sex, color, fugitives from, from the state, uh, number manumitted, whether they're deaf, dumb, blind, insane, or idiotic, which we have much nicer words for that these days. Um, but slave schedules and mortality schedules are two uh, temporary, I guess, documents that were created for a little while um, that can help. Mortality schedules would tell you this, um, they were helpful before death certificates became mandatory in the United States. So um, for a couple of decades, uh, there were mortality schedules where if anybody died the year before the census was taken, they would record those deaths. So if you don't have access to death records, you might be able to find what you're needing in the mortality schedules. All of that, of course, available on Ancestry as well. Um, this information right here is really good about finding a slaveholder. Um, if you are able to find an, an ancestor, um, after or from 1870 on or in the 1870s get um 1870 census really because that would be the census that was dr directly after the emancipation of slaves um if you're able to find your ancestor on the 1870 census then look around at other white landowning families in the same area that that ancestor lived in and it's most likely because most um, formerly enslaved people did end up staying nearby where they were enslaved. So it's highly likely that one of those white landowning families in the area may have been the enslavers of your ancestor if they were in fact enslaved before 1870. So if that's kind of a stumbling block for you in your research, not really knowing where they were before they were free, that's a good way to kind of put the pieces together. Look at that information and go from there. Ancestry also has um, international records as well. I know that they have records from the UK and from Canada. Um, they may have some other countries too, but I know those in particular um, are international records that they house. So if that's something that you need to look into is as well, um, that's an option on Ancestry. Find a grave. Find a grave is another really common um, resource for genealogy research. Um, of course, this is just cemetery records and stuff, um, but cemetery records can be very helpful because if you're needing to find families, families are usually buried together. They're usually buried in locations near if not directly in where they spent most of their, their time, at least in their later life, um, or later in their life. 
And so cemetery records and just going to the cemetery and looking at the actual graves can be really helpful. Find a Grave has photographs that you can look at as well. It's one of those things that's just kind of done, like whoever wants to can upload information on it. So you have people, some people will go and be really in depth and take photographs and stuff and some of them won't. So it just kind of depends on what the cemetery is and who updated that section. But this is what Find a Grave looks like. You can research exactly who you're looking for or you can go up here to cemeteries. And if you're not sure the name of the cemetery, or if there are like multiple cemeteries and you're just not sure where your ancestor might be um, buried, then you can go here and we, oh goodness, I can't type. Um, we'll look at Com Cohoma County, Mississippi. <coughs> you do search. And it gives you a list of the cemeteries in Cahoma County that um, you can just click on and, and look through and see what information they have and you may be able to find your ancestor that way. So that's an option. Um, it's a free site so you can work on this from home. You don't have to necessarily be at a library or archive to look this to look at it and find a grave. So that's also a good resource. Um, these three I really wanted to just briefly mention Heritage Quest, Family Search, and Roots Web. Um, Heritage Quest, I'll just kind of, I'll take a second to show you what it looks like. Um, it's a database that if your public library doesn't have access to Ancestry.com, it's possible that they might have access to this um, instead. Um, and it's just a database that you can um, look through you'll see like you can look through census records and like click on the census from 1940. As you can see it looks a lot like the Ancestry search page <laughs> as well um, but you can fill in um, as much information as you have to help with the search and um, it's also uh, I believe it's powered by Ancestry so they kind of work hand in hand um, along with the National Archives. So this is another option that you can go through your library um, to search. And Ancestry probably has the most resources, but um, Heritage Quest has, has a lot as well. So like I said, if you can't access Ancestry.com, um, then maybe check out Her Heritage Quest instead. FamilySearch.org is one that's also gained popularity over the last few years. It is, um, it is a free service, so you can access this from home. Um, it doesn't have the resources that Heritage Quest and Family Search have. A lot of their resources are from uh, genealogies that have already been worked on and researched. Um, this is actually a website that I believe was started by the LDS Church. Yes. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, so that's a that's separate from Ancestry and Heritage Quest. They kind of like do their own thing, but you can have a free account here and they have um, helpful resources here. It's worth checking out. So I just wanted to mention that one. And RootsWeb is the last one. It's not really, um, it doesn't have like the records and things that that Ancestry and Heritage Quest have, but it's really good for communicating with other genealogists. And um, this is specifically, I wanted to show you um, one of their message boards. You can search for Mississippi and it'll bring up all of these different message boards. Like you have um, some people from different counties in Mississippi and you can share with other genealogists research that you've done and you can all kind of help each other and it's kind of a community-based thing. So if that's something that you're interested in, that could be helpful as well. Newspapers.com is a really great way to access newspapers. <laughs> Again, it is a subscription service. 
So um, if it's not available at your public library, which a lot of public libraries don't have access to newspapers.com, and if they do, it might be limited access. It's something that's worth checking with your library about, um, because if they have access, definitely use it. But um, otherwise, you have to have a subscription, a paid, a paid subscription to newspapers.com. But they have all kinds of digitized newspapers. It won't let me show you very much right here. Let's see. Search for Mr. Dickerson. Yeah, so when you search, you can narrow things down to the state that you're looking for. Again, it won't let me go further without a subscription here, but um, it's pretty easy to search. You just type in what you're looking for. You can search for individual papers or you can search for specific items in those papers. It's pretty easy to navigate. As I mentioned, newspapers are great for looking at obituaries and getting names of family members and dates and things from that, marriage announcements, community news, all that. This um, is sort of backtracking a little bit to our Chronicling America newspapers, but you can actually look at, um, you can type in African American on the Library of Congress's Chronicling America page, and it'll show you a list of all the African American newspapers. Um, or black owned newspapers uh, for the different states. So Mississippi starts right here with African or the Afro American Courier. And it goes down to um, this last one out of Cary, Mississippi. So what you can do is you can look here, at, or sorry, you can, <laughs> you can look um, here and click on the information and go to holdings like I showed you before um, to see which repositories have copies of of these newspapers or you can if you have a subscription to newspapers.com look them up on there and just see newspapers.com does not have every newspaper on the planet or anything like that but it does have a really good selection so you just kind of have to weigh the pros and cons of whether it's worth getting a subscription or not either way look at newspapers no matter where you get them from because they can be very helpful the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau is specific to African American genealogy. I'm going to pause for a drink. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau is specific to uh, Black ancestry, actually, and can be a very, very good resource for directly after the Civil War and early on in the Reconstruction era. So a little bit of background information about the Freedmen's Bureau. They were a federal, um, they were created out of a federal act that was passed by Congress to provide food, shelter, clothing, medical services, and land to displaced Southerners, including newly freed African Americans. They also established schools, which you can see in this photograph here, the Freedmen's School, they established schools all over the South, um, supervised contracts between freedmen and employers. Um, this, of course, was to ensure that there wasn't any kind of hostility there and there, you didn't have former enslavers trying to re-enslave <laughs> the emancipated um, enslaved people. So, um, and they also managed confiscated or abandoned lands. So some of the records that they created that can be very helpful in researching Black ancestry, they have medical records, local census records, uh, marriage records, and they also have information about former enslavers, and they have the names of, of the slaves, the formerly enslaved as well. So they have a lot of good records that are specific to African Americans. Um, the... National Museum of African American History and Culture has some information on the Freedmen's Bureau here on their website that I just wanted to show you. They have a transcription project that's going on here. Um, so that might be of interest to check out and a little bit of history about that as well. Um, 
the National Archives, of course, as I mentioned, houses um, microfilmed copies of Freedmen Bureau, Freedmen's Bureau records. And this is accessed frequently. I know at the one in Atlanta, the, the National Archives branch in Atlanta, um, you can read more about those records here. Um, and you also have state archives that house Freedmen's Bureau records. And Ancestry.com also houses <laughs> Freedmen's Bureau records. Um, so again, if you have a subscription to them, to Ancestry.com, you can access some of these records as well. So there are multiple repositories that have Freedmen's Bureau records. If you're looking for an ancestor that um, was uh, around during Reconstruction and right immediately after the Civil War, the Freedmen's Bureau records can be um, very helpful. So definitely check those out. That's all of the records that are the resources that I wanted to mention in this video. Of course, as I said, these are, these are only a few. These are some of the more commonly used ones. There are many more out there, but this is just a good, um, a good list to kind of get you started and give you an idea of what repositories house what records. So in the next video, we're going to be talking about Mississippi resources. So all my Mississippi folks, stick around for that. Um, and then our final video, we're just going to do some additional resources and guides for you as well. Um, you can contact our reference staff if you have any questions about anything that we mentioned in this video. If you're a librarian and you need some help with some genealogy research, or if you're a genealogist, if you're researching your own family history, and need any kind of assistance or more information, our reference staff at MLC is always glad to help. As you can see on the screen, we have our contact information. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. We love to help people with their research. So thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time.